This is a new and strange environment at first, suddenly finding yourself in orbit. I'm Neville Andrew Mara, and this is Never Normal, a show about breaking free from the boring default plan and living life on your terms instead. My guest today has been celebrated by National Geographic and the California Outdoors Hall of Fame. When you hear about his travel and adventure accomplishments, you might think I'm describing Magellan or Lewis and Clark. Francis Tapon has hiked the Appalachian Trail, the Pacific Crest Trail, and in 2007, he became the first person to walk the 5,600 miles from Mexico to Canada and back to Mexico along the Continental Divide Trail. In addition to walking across America four times, Francis has walked across Spain twice and visited 120 countries in total. But he's not exactly jetting from place to place and collecting flags as fast as he can. In March 2013, Francis set off on a trip to explore Africa. He spent five and a half years doing just that, visiting all 54 African countries and climbing the tallest mountains in 50 of those countries. Francis, welcome to Never Normal. So nice to be here. Thank you so much. Uh, out of all the guests I've had so far, I think you you embody the Never Normal probably better than anybody else, and that's... <laughs> I think that's saying something. <laughs> I, I want to go back to the beginning. Like, how did all of this start? You know, were you what kind of vacations did you go on as a kid? Was this like, have you always traveled this way, or was there? When did you get it? When did you decide, like, oh yeah, I'm just gonna, you know, walk across, clear across America? Yeah. Well, my mom is from Chile. My father is French, and I was born in San Francisco. And so, as a result, I was in order to see any kind of family, I would have to get onto a plane and go a, a great distance. My dad had a bit of wanderlust. <clears throat> he liked to travel quite a bit. And so probably there's some genetic, you know, disposition there that I, that I have. And um, so, yeah, so I think that's where it all started, perhaps. One kind of common theme in your travels is you sort of take the long route and, and often walk, right, or hike how did that how did you decide or what what is there something about walking specifically that for you um is just like the preferred you know mode of transportation obviously you could you could get from point a to point b faster why do you choose to walk from something like mexico to canada and back i've always been pretty athletic and so i think part of it is just i enjoy the endorphins that come from doing exercise and so i think that's one of the issues um i really got into backpacking when I was like 30 years old and my parents never really took me on any kind of camping trip or anything like that. So it's, I can't really credit them for that. And, but when I got into it, I was like, I think part of the walking experience is it's meditative. I mean, there's some people who meditate every day, which I don't, uh, I probably should. I hear it's great. I just can't focus that well. But when you're walking and especially back in the day before we had smartphones and little gadgets, you didn't have anything in your ears to distract you. So, I mean, you literally had nothing else to do except put one foot in front of the other and look around at the scenery. That was it. And so there's something meditative about that. When you start, at, uh, some people could get bored out of their mind for doing that. And I could understand that. Sometimes I got bored too. But just like I think people who go on meditation retreats or these silent retreats where they don't talk to anybody for a month or something like that, I think there's, you, you, break through a threshold sometimes not everybody does it but they break through this point where they have some aha moments and they really start to really think about things that they hadn't thought about or think about things in a different perspective and you become never normal <laughs> thank you um i yeah I, the the analogy to meditation is interesting because i think in both cases you either are or you learn to become comfortable with yourself right we can it's very easy to sit in front of a computer or a smartphone these days and just fill yourself with distractions or, or just like, you know, information, read the news, check whatever's going on, just totally overstimulate yourself to the point where you're never really just like alone in a quiet place and and dealing with your own thoughts, your own emotions. I can imagine when you're walking, there's got to be some days where it's just like you're basically just on the side of a road with not a lot of scenery and just going and there's really nothing there besides you and yourself. 
Right. Although I almost never did road walks, so there was I was always through the mountains. So usually the 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 scenery was pretty stimulating. But when you're walking across, let's say deserts, there's about 700 miles of deserts in California and Southern California. There's about another 700 miles of deserts in New Mexico. Deserts sometimes can have monotonous scenery, although I love them. But anyway, sometimes they can. And so therefore, you don't. it's kind of like walking on the side of a road where it's lack, a lack of stimulation. But again, it allows you to transport your mind somewhere else. And just in some ways, like for example, the opposite of that is when I was walking through a thousand kilometers of snow in Colorado. Then you're just so focused. I mean, you have to focus on every step because you're post holding. And for those who don't know what post holding means, it means that you step on kind of semi hard snow and your foot breaks through the snow and then you kind of get stuck. And so every single step is laborious. So you can't even see the fucking trail. And so that makes it very difficult. Um, and so therefore you have to be focused. You have to say, am I going north, east, west, south? What, which direction am I going to? Where could the trail be? And you're, 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 you're just, you're very alert uh, when you're hiking through snow versus hiking on a simple path that's in a desert that's clear and obvious. So anyway, so you go from these, from these different types of extremes. Yeah, I, I can see that. I mean, even for me, like skiing, for example, there's times where it's just, it's, it's, meditative in, in the way that you're describing where it's difficult enough that I'm just sort of forced to put away all these other thoughts and just focus on the one it like brings your full focus to bear on the one thing at hand because I know it's like you know either you you follow that line or you're going to wipe out on the way down and so you've just got to like channel your entire focus to where you're going as opposed to you know th that thing someone said in a meeting or you know you're worried about that exam next week or anything else that's not here and now on your mexico canada mexico hike i read that you were hiking with a pack that weighed less than three kilos or less than six pounds in total is that right that's right yeah it's less than six and a half pounds that's without food and water though so that's just gear um so the actual when you throw in food and water like for example when you're walking across desert you might not have any kind of um, water for let's say 40 kilometers and so as a result you have to carry a lot of water which adds a lot of weight um, so the actual weight of the pack with food and water would be at the maximum 15 kilograms which is about 35 pounds maximum i mean that that's when i was totally loaded with food and water but that was very rare the average weight of my pack was probably closer to 15 pounds or about seven kilograms. Now, I mean, when I think about, you know, travel, especially like going to an airport or something and, you know, having a, like a big suitcase packed full of stuff, most people run into the problem of uh, their suitcase is so heavy that they're like paying extra fees and things like that. And there, I mean, you were going for seven months, you know, no shelter, just you, uh, you know, hiking. Uh, and you were doing it with with. Le oh, I had a shelter. I had a tarp. Uh, no, you know, <laughs> external like hotel or whatever. I mean, yes, uh, what, whatever <laughs> right, right, you right, had, right. you were carrying with you, and you were doing that with with under six pounds. Whereas you know, people are taking a suitcase and they're struggling to get by with like a forty pound weight limit from an airline, for example. <laughs> I'm really curious what goes. I mean, right. so so that and and they're only going for a weekend. And they're going for a weekend, and you're going for seven <laughs> months through desert, mountain, <laughs> snow, rain, and God knows what else. Um, so every mosquitoes, mosquitoes, um, every single you know ounce of weight that goes into that pack, I'm sure is is um, very carefully thought out. What would surprise a lot of people when they think about backpackers and mountaineers and that kind of stuff they all oh, i gotta bring a big knife i think i had like a teeny tiny knife that was you know a, a few centimeters i mean it was I don't, that was about it um so that might surprise some people that I didn't bring like some honking knife to defend myself against the bears <laughs> um or whatever but in general uh the other thing that's important obviously is your sleeping bag and uh, just a minimal amount of clothing. Now, I had a, a sleeping bag that's made out of from a company called Jacks Are Better, and they and it's the letter R, so Jacks Are Better. I really like their sleeping bag because you can actually wear it as a serape. So it's basically it has a hole in the middle that that is attached with Velcro, and then you put it over your head and you wrap it around yourself. As a result, I didn't bring a parka, so that could surprise a lot of people, saying, "Wow, you went through the snow without even a jacket." I had like a teeny thin three ounce windbreaker 
Um, and that was it. Well, the secret was that when I woke up in the morning, I got out of my sleeping bag and then wore my sleeping bag. And then the other secret to staying warm in the cold temperatures is just keep moving because your body generates a ton of heat just walking. And so as a result, as long as I kept moving, I would usually stay warm even in kind of uh, cold conditions. And is there anything anything else that you bring that would surprise, or that you do bring rather that would surprise people? Anything, uh, do you bring any sort of entertainment with you? Anything, uh, book or anything like that? I mean, it's such a small amount of weight that you're carrying. I imagine it doesn't leave a lot of room for anything other than the bare necessities. I did on the content. So I didn't bring any kind of entertainment on the Appalachian Trail or the Pacific Crest Trail, but on the Continental Divide Trail, I did eventually bring, I think a few, a couple of months into the trip, I bought an, a little MP3 player. So it was a tiny little thing that I could store audiobooks or, or that kind of stuff or podcasts. Um, I don't even know if podcasts exist back then, but definitely audiobooks existed. And uh, this was 2007. So I listened to that uh, until the batteries ran out. I just put in a double A battery because I couldn't have a way to recharge. So I would just carry a couple double A batteries with me. And that was my entertainment. Now, as far as books are concerned, in order to walk 35 miles a day, you don't have to walk fast, but you have to walk constantly. And so you're walking at a normal place. Uh, one point, I remember this guy who was 60 years old passed me. I mean, I was walking, I wasn't walking very fast, but I was walking from sunrise to sunset. I would walk, you know, sometimes 14 hours a day, sometimes even more, 15. But as a result, you can put in the miles. So if you're walking only three miles an hour, you, you know, you just do the math, you can pump in 35 miles uh, just by walking constantly. I would walk while I eat. I walked while I brushed my tooth, my teeth. I even walked while I took a piss. <laughs> I was constantly walking. And so as a result, uh, you could do a big amount of miles. The, that, the, the side effect of all that walking is that at the end of the day, you really have zero energy to read a book. That almost seems like a feature rather than a bug, as they say, that you're just sort of always on the go. You get the miles, you're not as... You're not you're not like kind of sprinting and then resting and then sprinting and resting. You're just at like a steady, continual pace. And then yeah, there's no sort of downtime where you're bored or just like sitting there hungry or something like that. Like you're just always on the move. Is there anything that um that other people who do these kind of like long distance or through hikes typically bring? You mentioned the knife, or that other people would maybe expect you to bring that you intentionally leave out that you just you know don't see as necessary. I remember that I took for my underwear, I use basically spandex shorts. So they're like, they look like biker shorts. If you're familiar with what a, a, how a biker short looks like, they're kind of hug you tight. And that would be my underwear as well. So in other words, I wouldn't have any. So I would, and, and what I would do is I would go into a, when I go into town, so I would typically carry about four days worth of food. And so, because after, once you get to like five, six days of food, your pack starts getting really heavy and it starts to not make any sense. So I would resupply at towns that were near the trail, not on the trail. So I would often have to hitchhike down the mountain in order to get food and then hitchhike back up the mountain to where I left off to keep going. When I went to a restaurant, uh, I would go into the bathrooms that you could lock yourself into. Those were the best bathrooms. And then I would just do my laundry. I would just wash in a sink my clothes while I put my order in. So I'd say I order you know, some food. Let's say I order some pasta. And while they're cooking it, I'd go in there and just wash my underwear and then put it right back on, wet. And while I was eating in the warm restaurant, it would dry because it was a fast-drying material. And then I'd wash my shirt. And put it back on, even if it's wet. Or sometimes I would have a spare one. But anyway, I only had two shirts and two underwears. It sounds incredibly unpleasant. It, you know, it sounds unpleasant. But you know, I guess I have a high degree of tolerance for discomfort. And for so for me, it didn't bother me. I was like, I'm in a warm restaurant. This kind of feels kind of cool on my body. And then by the time I left the restaurant, it was pretty much dry. And if it wasn't, you know, just a bit of walking generates body heat and it will dry out whatever you're wearing. So, yeah, I, I don't, I'm trying to think of other things that people would bring, but I, 
I'm sure there's a million things that people bring that is are sentimental or important or they think it's important that I don't bring. But uh, I have a list of my gear list on my website. So if anybody's curious, they just go to mynames.com slash CDT, so Continental Divide Trail. And then there's a gear list. If you, if you click somewhere there, you'll you'll find a gear list and it'll list exactly all the little things that I brought. I'll make sure we... So, yeah. The other thing that might surprise people is I didn't purify water very often. Huh. Um, almost never, in fact. I think I had it like a f- couple of tablets to purify, but I think picking your water sources was more important than just picking a random source and then purifying that. So I would be very picky about where I got my water and I got to be fairly good. I never had Jardia, so that was another thing that I did that is somewhat unusual for backpackers. Yeah, that would be my first concern, as soon as you said, like, not purifying water. But I suppose if you know where the stream is coming from and you're, you know, a seasoned pro at doing this and, and no animals are sort of upstream of you using it as a toilet, you're you're okay because that's the concern. Uh, you mentioned a, a high degree of tolerance for discomfort. I, I think that goes without saying. That's perhaps the understatement of the century here is that, uh, it, I mean, in order to even consider most of these adventures you've been on. I think that tolerance for discomfort is uh, is a prerequisite. But it's something that I think most people could probably uh, build in themselves with uh, if they have the desire, you know, is to start small and uh, and realize that, yeah, sometimes it's a little uncomfortable, but there's a trade-off. And the, the more you're willing to be a little uncomfortable, the more cool, exciting adventures, different experiences you can have along the way. True. Yeah. And I think that... It serves you so well. And so everybody has a, a, a risk tolerance. Some people have a discomfort tolerance. Everybody has that. But it really serves you so well to try to push that further out and, and really stretch yourself. The reason is, is that, for example, when I went to five for five years in Africa and I came back here, I found it utterly thrilling to have hot water and, and just or turn on a light and electricity came on. And by the way, I had appreciation when I was on the Appalachian Trail, the Pacific Crest Trail, when I'd come and like suddenly I had a warm, dry bed. So a lot about life and your happiness in life is all about gratitude. And in the 21st century, we as homo sapiens, especially in the high in- high income world, have become incredibly soft and just demanding about all sorts of things that our ancestors didn't have, and we've set a new bar. So my suggestion is to lower that bar down so that whenever life gets a bit challenging and difficult, or what some people think is challenging and difficult, you'll look back and say, I've done so much worse than this. This is fine. I can get through this. And I think that I think is something that can be a lifelong skill that will keep you happy. I couldn't agree more. And I should say I'm 100% guilty of what you're talking about, right? And uh, I think Louis Louis C.K., the comedian, has a, has a bit about this. I think it was Louis C.K. that, like, you know, even just a few years ago, there was no such thing as, as uh, internet or like Wi-Fi on an airplane. And now it's like, you know, they've introduced it. And immediately, as soon as it goes down, everybody's like, oh, God, the Wi-Fi on the airplane is down. And he's like, you're sitting on a chair in the sky, <laughs> and it's like the internet went down for a minute and all of a sudden it's the worst day of your life. They'll, they'll complain that it's slow internet. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> slow internet at 600 miles an hour. I can't watch my fucking YouTube. What's wrong with this? I can't watch YouTube. Yeah. I can't watch my porn on the airplane. <laughs> I don't recommend watching porn on an airplane, but I do recommend <laughs> practicing what you described, which is being comfortable with less. And and I think it is something that the Stoic philosophers talk about this, that it's something that you can deliberately practice. Like to, to and I mean, your, your history and your life so far is, is a, a great example of this, but just basically deliberately depriving yourself, right? Because most of us, as you said, who live in these kind of first world countries have very comfortable lives for whatever you know, difficulties we may face in general, we're very comfortable. Most of us have, you know, hot water and shelter and all the basics. And so we get, you know, bent out of shape when we're missing something much more trivial than those. And so it's like if you just take a bit of time and subtract, you know, go camping or something like that and just don't have some you know, a hot shower, it's such a simple thing. And then to appreciate it when you when you have it again uh, is, a, is a powerful. Is that something that you 
deliberately practice now yourself? Do you like schedule time, you know, in discomfort or do your travels just kind of provide enough of that? Yeah, I guess my travels provide it. And then of course my memories and my history has, has done that a lot. So to me, it's, it's not, uh, it's now second nature. So I, I'm, I'm very grateful every fucking day, every single day. Sometimes I, I'm just like when I'm tying my shoes, I'm looking at my fingers and I'm like, wow, I'm so grateful that all these fingers are still working, you know, that there's coordination and they can do that. They're not trembling, you know, just like, or like, I'm grateful that my elbow doesn't hurt, you know, it's like, wow, look at that. My elbow is still working well, you know, I just, I, I look, I think about things, the random things like, wow, my, my eye is not itchy, you know, hey, my nose is not running right now, you know, I'm not coughing. You know, there's, <laughs> just, you can just go on a list of things that are just going right all the time. Your body's amazing. My heart is still fucking beating. It's amazing. It just doesn't stop. And hey, these are all good things. And you just, it, as a result, you can just feel a lot better about everything. Absolutely. I mean, this is such an important topic. It's definitely a, a detour from, from travel, but I think it's a great example of the kind of lesson that you can learn by, as we said, sort of depriving yourself. But I go out of my way to try to practice that gratitude and do exactly what you're talking about. Just take a moment to realize that like, even if you have some small calamity in your life, like that, yeah, your heart is still beating just that alone as a baseline. Like if that's, if that's working, things are going okay. Like it could be a lot worse. And, um, having that as a routine in your day or just like little checkpoints where you check in and you say to yourself, you know, is everything okay or not? My heart's beating. I've still got two eyes. Not that you couldn't get by without those, but you know, little things like that. One of the most common ones you mentioned, uh, like your nose isn't running. I think for, for almost all of us, whenever we get sick and you end up with like a stuffy nose or something, it's, it's annoying. I mean, it's, you know, minor, but it's annoying when you can't breathe comfortably. And, uh, as soon as it comes back, like we just sort of go back to normal once our we get over the cold or whatever and it's so rare that we actually stop and say like thank god my nose is just like clear today i can breathe normally right what yeah, while we're on the absolutely. subject of gratitude just one other kind of uh quick one i i do myself is i try to whenever i feel sort of like just even slightly annoyed like oh i have to do this or i have to do that i try to reframe it as i get to so like my wife and I just had a baby a few months ago and there's times where it's like, you know, you're busy with something and you realize, oh, I got to go change your diaper. Oh, I have to change your diaper. And it's by no, I mean, first of all, my wife does 99% of that. I really have no place to complain, but still like you might have this thought in your mind where you're kind of busy doing something and, or you thought, you know, you're running late and you're like, oh no, no, I got to have to change your diaper. And I just try to catch that thought as it comes up in my mind and switch it to, I get to change your diaper. I get to because I have her because she's here because she's okay. But also just the simple things like I have diapers like we have a stock of diapers. How much more annoying would this problem be if I didn't have any clean diapers right now? Or if diapers hadn't even been invented yet and I had to go wash some, you know, weird cloth or something just to like there's a million little things like that where you can just like all the way down the line, just be like grateful for the fact that that you get to do something rather than you you have to do something in many african villages that i visited uh, the babies would just run around without any diapers whatsoever because they didn't have uh they just have sand you know sometimes some some of the houses themselves are you know sand floors um or whatever so if the baby pees or poops it just drops and and they're always there's no kind of diaper rash because there's no diaper <laughs> um and if they did have diapers, if they do wear them, you know, yeah, they it's cotton and they have to hand wash every single diaper. And just then that's how human civilization was for, for, uh, for ever f until the last couple decades. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, that was everywhere. It's only this whole concept of diapers are, are fairly recent. I, I'd love to. Uh, disposable diapers. Yeah. Disposable diapers are what we think of now yeah. as a diaper. As opposed to yes, like the if you right. can think of like the cartoon baby with like the uh, the safety pin on the right. side, right? Because they had like a cloth thing and you had to right. pin it. Um, I'd love to kind of pick up that as a as a topic though, not diapers, but you've spent time as we discussed in fifty four different all fifty four African countries uh, over five and a half years, and you spent. I mean, we could do the math five and a half years, 54 countries, but you spent, uh, let's say, a non-trivial amount of time, like weeks in each country. 
You weren't just kind of five weeks on average, five weeks on average in each country. So you really had a chance to get to know the lifestyle, the local people in each place um, to see kind of like a, I mean, you were also climbing mountains. So to, to get in touch with some of the nature and all that, you weren't kind of flying in, buying a souvenir at the airport and heading to the next country. Yeah, I was always over land. I was always, uh, I would drive places. Um, I had a car and the truck basically uh, and, yeah, I never, I very, very rarely took planes. Planes were mainly to, in order to get to the island nations. There's seven island nations. And so obviously you can't drive there. I want to kind of go back to a point you made of just seeing a different way of doing things. Um, what could or, or should we in America learn from Africa? I mean, it, it feels almost ridiculous to reduce Africa, at least 54 different countries, to just Africa. But are there were there certain – we talked kind of philosophically before. So are there certain other things like that that you experienced that, uh, that you sort of brought back with you from your trip as uh, – either new practices or beliefs from from your travels well, i did bring back a you know one thing we talked about is just this gratitude thing and so i by all those experiences with africans i could realize like wow these guys are happier than many americans and yet they have a tenth of what the typical american may have and so obviously a lot of this is in your mind um and i think the number one thing that I was impressed with perhaps among the Africans is their forgiveness. Their society in general, again, there's 54 countries, so there's a lot of diversity. However, one of the common themes that I would find is that Africans have a tendency to be more forgiving than any other continent, uh, people from any other continent. And I try to do that now. And just the other thing, obviously, is they're very patient. Um, they So those are two attributes that I have tried to incorporate in my life forgiveness and patience and that is a common theme that you are a common positive theme that you find in africa so it's easier said than done but i think that when you see it in action it's it's motivating and there are some side effects to that there's it's a double-edged sword when you when a society is very forgiving it can it can encourage abuse of that forgiveness so that people might be more likely to do things that are either wrong or um, irresponsible because they know they'll be forgiven for their sin. Um, so that's the downside, but there's obviously many positives that come out of that as well. So that's, I focus on the positive. And while you were on that trip, I'm not sure how about, I think it was about halfway through, something else happened. <laughs> you fell in love. When I was in Cameroon, which is a country in the middle of Africa, I met a woman named Rejoice, as in to celebrate. And Rejoice and I got married in Zambia, which near Victoria Falls. And then she traveled with me to about 32 African countries. So nearly half the trip I was alone, and nearly half the trip I was with Rejoice. It's a, a, an amazing story. I mean, I, that, like, that, that alone feels like... A lot of your adventures feel like they could be turned into a movie or uh, some of them have been turned into a book. Um, just just that, though, just kind of falling in love in, in Cameroon and uh, getting married in Zambia and continuing to travel together is another fairy tale. How did you decide to actually get married while traveling as opposed to just kind of, you know, continuing the trip together and, and maybe seeing where it goes? Part of it was practical. Um the ironic thing is neither of us were very excited to get married in the sense that, you know, like we, it's just an institution. We're not like, you know, religious. She, she's not religious, which is by the way, hyper rare in Africa. I think one in 10,000 people is not religious in Africa. So it's super, super rare. But, um, but what the problem with her is that she's from Cameroon and the Cameroon passport can go to only about 46 countries i think without a visa without a prior to getting to a visa and getting a visa is very difficult and so if i'm not married to her there's it would be extremely difficult for her to travel within africa very very difficult it was difficult even being married to me even though we had the paperwork even though we had the marriage certificate even though my name was on her passport <laughs> um it's it was still a challenge to get her into countries. And I often had to 
you know, slam my fist on the table and say, come on, guys, I want to bring my wife to Ethiopia. Why can't, you know, I'm not going to just leave her behind. You know, we're traveling over land. As one does. And yeah. uh, it was upsetting for her to think that here she is, an African who cannot visit her own continent. And here I am, a non-African from another continent. And yet I have no problems just going everywhere. And they throw me visas, you know, easily. So it's an unfortunate uh, situation that Africa has been improving, but that's one practical reason why we said, okay, if I want to be with this lady, and certainly I knew that if I want to travel with her outside of Africa, then it's completely difficult, you know, let, you know, forget about coming to America. You know, she's just, it would just not work. So I had to face a decision, you know, like either I marry her or I say goodbye. That's, that was, that was the option. Uh, because, you know, girlfriend, boyfriend, just not going to work. So I said, okay, well, I'm, a, you know, I'm 46 years old. I've never been married in my life. Let's give it a go. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. So it, it took me a while to find that, that, the woman I was willing to marry and, and she was it. And so Cameroon, that's, that's it. amazing. <laughs> I, I love that story. Congratulations uh, to you and rejoice a little bit belated, but thank you. So now it's been almost five years, practically, since I first met her. I come from a, a sort of mixed cultural background like yourself. You said you're uh, French and Chilean. I'm uh, half Irish and half Indian, uh, living in Spain at the moment, but I grew up in the U.S. And uh, my wife is Russian, so we've got a lot of kind of cultural influences swimming around in our family and, and yours as well. How how has that gone over the first, you know, almost five years now? Have there been any sort of major cultural clashes, any... Um, any things that you've sort of discovered where you kind of take it for granted that there's a certain way of doing something and that's just not a, a universal thing? You know, it's funny because we sometimes joke, Rejoice and I joke that I'm more African than she is and she's more American than I am. <laughs> uh, she's, so as a result, our sometimes our, our clashes have to do with I'm more easygoing than she is, which is a classic African trait. And she's more like a little Nazi and like, you know, let's do things this way, this way, plan, plan things out. And uh, so, so she's not, she's never normal regarding to Africa. <laughs> she's not a normal African in many ways. Um, certainly some aspects of her. So, uh, but I think, so I don't think that our disagreements or struggles or whatever are any are not that like classic African versus you, you know the United States perspective. It's it's uh, it's just personality traits. But it's she doesn't adopt a lot of the African traits that are that are classic. Um, so in that sense, we're we're kind of different. But I do predict, by the way, that Neville, your your baby, your child, is going to be a very interesting creature when she grows up i'm curious to ask more but but slightly afraid i just a quick side note though i will say um, no because because of your multicultural background in other words i think that that in itself is going to be if you know i think that and of course or you and i are biased because we're multicultural but i just think that when uh, children are exposed at an early age to many different cultures they're much more likely to be a world citizen and so i think as a result they become more open-minded, they become more curious, and they end up, you know, uh, being interesting in one way or another. They become never nor they're never normal <laughs> because they're they're not the classic Homo sapien who is uh, has a has a more uh, region regionalized uh, background. One country, one culture. And you can, by the way, for those who are listening to this and are watching this thing, you know, like, well, I was, you know, born in Chicago. My parents were from Chicago. I've always been from Chicago. Well, you can still cultivate that. You know, it's not like, you know, it's just that your daughter is spoiled. She she got lucky and I got spoiled. You got spoiled. We all got spoiled just because we were born into this environment. I mean, you and I didn't do anything to deserve this. So... Uh, we're just lucky. Yeah, digging into that a little bit more. Uh, it was actually Tim Ferriss was talking about this in a podcast episode, not in, in the context of being multicultural, but more in the sense of him. Uh, I think he studied abroad in Japan. And it's something that I always felt, but I hadn't quite put into words until I heard him say it. And it's basically this idea that when you're exposed to another culture early on, it's not that one culture is better than the other or anything like that, but more that 
seeing two different ways of doing things sort of flips a switch in your mind that like there isn't one sort of normal way or there isn't only one way. And I certainly had that in my house growing up. There was like, you know, my dad does something one way, my mom does something a different way. It wasn't necessarily a clash, but even just like, you know, religions, holidays, um, we all spoke English as a first language. So it wasn't a linguistic thing, but it's just various kind of little cultural elements where I saw that there were there were different ways you could do it. And again, neither one was presented as right or wrong. And so that sort of gave me this ability to just pick and choose. And and later on in life, it was like, oh, well, there's not only these two cultures, right? So as you travel and see more of the world, you can be like, oh, I really like the way they design bathrooms in Japan. I really like the way that, you know, uh, in Spain, they prioritize family and conversation and this idea of like the sobre mesa after you eat and like just sitting and talking and not always being in a rush and just, you know, not seeing that, okay, well, in my country, we do things a certain way and that's normal and everything else is, you know, maybe interesting on vacation. Whereas like I'm I feel like I'm just kind of collecting these various uh, little you know, bits and pieces from around the world as almost like cultural souvenirs. Right. <laughs> that's what that's exactly that's a good way of putting it. And we try to incorporate that in our everyday life. I think it's that's some that's the purpose of my travels is that I'm trying to pick up a lot of cultural souvenirs and trying to grab the best of humanity. But when people talk about this idea of like cultural appropriation, it, it never made any sense to me because it's like culture is not like a fixed thing that one person owns. We're all we're all borrowing and learning from each other anyway like there's 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 no thing that you can find in any culture like you know the entire japanese culture has elements of chinese culture that they borrowed at some point and became normal for them it's it's not a coincidence yeah and vice versa yeah absolutely it's not a coincidence that like ramen and lamian and uh if you go to like um i don't know uzbekistan or something and you find lagman like they're all noodle dishes that have sort of similar names. Like, yeah, that's not a coincidence. We've all been borrowing and learning from each other for as long as we've all been humans. And and yet, like, suddenly there's this idea that, like, oh, no, no, if you wear the, you know, the typical dress of that person or that culture, like, that's not allowed. You mentioned that that's kind of the inspiration for your travels. And we first got connected when I when I read your book, The Hidden Europe, and, and the subtitle is What Eastern Europeans Can Teach Us. And it's been, um, I think, 10 years since the book was first published. I know you're working on a on an updated 10th anniversary edition, but I'd love to just uh, dig into that subtitle a little bit. What can Eastern Europeans teach us? Yeah, um, they have a tremendous amount of grit, that's for sure. I mean, I think it comes from their historical background of the 20th century, which was really, really rough. I mean, one of the roughest places to be on the planet in the 20th century was Eastern Europe. They suffered through two wars. Um, they went, through, you know, the Nazis stormed in, the Soviets stormed in. <laughs> um, it was... Uh, it was, a, it, was a, it was And as a result, I think that, that there's no way that that could not have an impact on you as uh as your culture it, it will that will seep into your dna somehow and so as a result i think that that's one thing that uh is a common thread that eastern europeans uh have it's 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 a land of uh, of incredible grit and people who are you know also the weather itself i mean you're sitting in spain i'm sitting here in california mm -hmm. but eastern europe <laughs> the weather especially in the winter is often quite challenging so all that stuff kind of hardens you up and toughens you up and i think that that's something that uh is is good because again it goes back to what i was saying before you know i think that we as a species have become very soft in the 21st century that's something kind of surprising that i learned on my on my travels as well this idea of i mean it, it almost sounds cliched that like you know you go to russia and you think about you know winter being important but I think just in, in certain cultures overall, the cultures that have kind of strong seasons and especially harsh winters, the, the degree to which like preparing for winter, right, with, with the Game of Thrones, like winter is coming, um, the degree to which that's impacted the culture over the years in in some kind of predictable ways, but also in some that I didn't realize till much later, like 
I was traveling in Southeast Asia and places like Vietnam and Indonesia. And it's basically like there are seasons, but the seasons are like the wet season and the dry season and the burning season. They're not, you know, like fierce winter and then summer. And so things like something as simple as like, you know, fruit, let's say you can pull a mango off a tree kind of most times of the year. So you're basically never going to starve to death. Like there are other concerns, but you're just you're you're not going to um end up in like this harsh winter where there's nothing growing and that just creates i think a different set of priorities those are the the cultures and the countries that end up being more chilled out less anxious about the future less people on like anti-anxiety medication again other other challenges that they have and then you go to places that have harsh winters and they're much more like we got to prepare for the future we need to plan we stick to a schedule because i think at some point you know, in, in cultural memory is this idea that if you don't do those things, winter is going to come and you're not going to be prepared and you will have nothing to eat or you will have no shelter and you will freeze or starve. And death. you see that's certainly the case in Africa. And and there's a there's a, a compounding effect because in much of Africa, it's so debilitatingly hot that you really feel lethargic a lot of the day and you just have no energy and no desire to move your ass off and yeah there's a mango right there sitting on a tree you just pull a luck it there's abundant wildlife uh through much of african history so life flourishes in much of africa and it's not a harsh environment and the weather is the harsh part but it's but instead of like making you hunker down and like hurry and work like crazy it makes you just want to sit down and just sit underneath a tree which is what much of the continent does much of the time you're just sitting you see men just sitting in, underneath the tree just talking you know there's no air conditioning there's no electricity so it's like i think uh yeah it certainly infects the culture and it has to and that's part of that's part of the the process and that's just the reality. Yeah, and you can even see maybe like a less extreme, but still a similar effect between even like Northern and Southern Europe, right? The Southern European countries are the typically, you know, more relaxed, Spain, Italy, Portugal, right? Greece, just, yeah, less of like a go, 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 got to get it done. Let's, you know, work as hard as we can and uh, and be as efficient as possible. And then you compare that to, you know, say Finland, Germany, right? These cultures that have that sort of stereotypical Protestant work ethic, but just in general, more kind of like, uh, yeah, go, 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 uh, build amazing cars, you know, build cell phones, like all these, they're, they're much more like technically oriented uh, economies and cultures. Yeah, absolutely. Interesting Agreed. to see that. Oh, were there other um, takeaways that you had from Eastern Europe? Were there, I mean, again, you, you subtitled the book, What Eastern Europeans Can Teach Us. Uh, how else did your years of travel through the region kind of affect you or change your mindset? It made me think a lot about history. Uh, when you get into casual conversations with Europeans in general, they bring up history a lot more than Americans do. Americans have a short-term history. We even had a president who said, I think it was Truman, who said history is bunk. Um, in other words, like BS. Um, and so our, and, and there's some pros and cons to all this. Uh, it, there's some advantages to knowing your history and to thinking about it and knowing your origins and all that kind of stuff. At the other time, you can be, get swamped by it and let it rule your life and, to, and give you inflexibility. So I'm not suggesting one or the other, but it really, uh, I found it fascinating how much Europeans, more than I think I don't know any other continent, but certainly I, I'm, I'm imagine that I haven't been to China yet. I haven't been to India yet. They have a very long, rich written history. So my guess is that they're also kind of obsessed with history. But um, in other cultures like Latin America and, and Africa uh, and, and the United States, uh, you just don't see that. So the Americas and, Amer and Africa are just not as history focused as the European continent and probably the the Asian the rest of the Asian continent as well. So uh, there's some pros and cons to both of that, but I just found that fascinating, and I think it's something that it's ideally you learn from it, you watch history, you understand it, but you don't let it rule your life and get obsessed with it. It's a clever balance. Yeah, there's a um, there's a fantastic book. It's a bit academic, but I I really enjoyed it. It's uh it's called the Time Paradox, and it's um. I'm going to forget the both authors' names, but uh, one of them is um, Dr. Professor Zimbardo, who did the w one of the famous sociology experiments right back in, in Stanford in the, I think it was like the 60s or 70s. 
but they they talk a lot about the different time perspectives that we all have like are we more history focused or more future focused or you know more sort of in the present moment and there's no one perfect orientation like if you're all present focused right you're not building for the future and saving up for winter and and if you're you know stuck in the past maybe you have depression so there isn't so much a right or wrong but i think we often um you know we don't we don't realize that we are sort of oriented one way and that's not maybe the only option. And a lot of it, as we've been discussing, is actually cultural. One of the things that struck me is this idea that like as Americans, I think we're very future focused and we sort of always see that tomorrow is potentially better. You know, these days there's th that maybe is like crumbling a little bit. And I, I hope that's only a short term effect where, where people have started to get a little bit more pessimistic. But for most of, of, I think, both of our lifetimes, if you were to ask the average American person, will life in general be better, say, 10 years from now than today? The answer has almost always invariably in America been yes. In the world, in fact, I mean. And that's, well, I don't know that that's true for other cultures, though. That's that's the thing. Like when you talk about Eastern Europe, I oh, think right. there's, a, there's a fatalistic sense no. in a lot of countries where. Yeah. But, but I think that that's, yeah, you're right about that. I mean, because some of them have shrunken in size and, you know, they have this this yes there's ups and downs but i'm just saying in in the in over centuries should i say generally things have gotten better almost everywhere but i know what you're saying you're talking about um in a smaller uh thing america has pretty much gone uphill the entire time and we've never had a real real down downward uh, spiral like a certain countries like poland you know just disappeared from the entire map for 123 years um a lot of the baltic countries just gone after 20 years um and they got sucked up in the soviet union and on and on so they had much more severe ups and downs and so that sense yeah absolutely i agree with you i i like this i thought of this thing when i said uh that europeans live in the past uh americans live in the future and africans live in the present <laughs> that, that perfectly put i i think there's again these are broad generalizations but i think there's a lot of truth to that um and, and you mentioned you how, i mean how about how is it in spain for example i mean do you find that the, i mean in spanish like you said are, are uh, kind of like the more relaxed side of europe but i think yeah. that you're are you in valencia or yep i'm in valencia yeah so i mean that's a long rich cultural history i imagine the they're talking you know, when they talk about catalan and when they talk about galicia and they talk about their history in madrid and you know they probably just go off on you and you're like what? <laughs> there is an incredible amount of Spanish history that I certainly never learned in school and being here and realizing all these like separate kingdoms that were eventually united and all of that, that it's, it's, it's been eye opening. And the Moors. Uh, yeah. And wars and, and the, it's like, we sort of gloss over. It's like, Oh yeah, everyone knows the story, like the Moors. And there was uh you know, and then the Spanish came like, you know, reconquered the country and like kicked out the Moors. And, and we talk about it. Like it was this sort of like, you know, thing that happened for a few weeks. Whereas like for 700 years, this was like part of the Muslim empire at that time. And the number, when you start digging into it, the number of cities, the number of words, the number of buildings, the, the here in Valencia, for example, it's, uh, it's, it's almost kind of like the breadbasket of Spain, right? We grow not just the oranges that, uh, that are, you know, Valencia is named for or vice versa, but, um, a ton of rice, uh, paella. In America, we think of paella as like a Spanish dish, but Spanish think of paella as a Valencian dish. It's like a regional specific thing. All the rice for that grows here, just like on the outskirts of the city. There's these giant like rice patties. Looks like you're in like Bali or something like that. Uh, if you just go just even like a tiny bit outside the city, it's very, um, uh, there's a lot of agriculture and all kinds of fruits and things. And reading the history of Spain, like that, that, was brought that technology of irrigation and the and turning this into like the breadbasket was brought by the Arabs or the North Africans rather uh, who came and and conquered and and ran this area for 700 years. But for us, it's just like oh yeah, yeah there was some period where the, you know the Moors were there. Um, Spanish history is one part of it, but I think there's certainly a different attitude when it comes towards time in general. Kind of famously, right? All the um, the the manana manana uh it, it it's interesting to see how it applies though across across different cultures because i would say in american culture if you are you know on your way to an appointment or something like that and maybe you run into a friend uh, the fact that you have a scheduled event like takes precedence without question 
right? That you you need to go somewhere and that's your priority. Whereas here, uh, if you if you you know run into someone at the grocery store or you happen to know the clerk or you know two people meet each other on the street, those are often long conversations where people just happen to bump into each other and then just talk for like 20 minutes. And the fact that someone's got an appointment or there's someone waiting in line at the hair salon or whatever. It, doesn't matter like the the more important thing is keeping that connection going and like not um like not being rude to the other person by by sort of being curt or short with them and uh and the the fact that there's an appointment well whatever if we're 15 minutes late it's it's not the end of the world i don't want to upset grandma by not acknowledging her when i bump into her on the street just because i'm running late to something and that's big that's a very popular thing to do in africa even more so They take it to another level. <laughs> it can be frustrating at times when you're on the wrong end of that, like you're running late for something or you know, you're know you next in line and, and they're just having this long conversation. But it, it does make you kind of stop and question, like, what is really important? Like, so what if I'm 15 minutes late? Like, why is that such a big deal relative to just the human side of things, like honoring the fact that you happen to see this person, right? We talked about gratitude before. It's like, well, you know, you bump into like a family member or something like that. Maybe you should be you know, grateful for that. The fact that that happened and that they're still here because you never know. I'm, I'm of two minds about it, right? We talked about borrowing from different cultures. I tend to be a pretty like scheduled, future oriented, go, go, go person. So being here is like a kind of tempers that a little bit. And I, we, we talked a little bit about your books. So the hidden Europe, but you had a, another book before that hike your own hike. And uh, is there is there an Africa book coming? Because you spent, as we said, five and a half years there and traveled all throughout. Are you uh, are you working yeah, on something? Yeah, and I'm pumping out to those who want to get the chapters as I write them. I have a Patreon account, and so just go to Patreon F Tap on my last name, uh, then you'll find it. And and I send out a chapter, at least a chapter a month, uh, usually more. And I'm hoping to get it done by next year. Well, in fact, it has to get done by next year. No question about it. Uh, right now, I'm in the embroiled in, in in revising my Hidden Europe book. But yeah, there will be an Africa book. It's called The Unseen Africa. And five years of travel to all 54 African countries. And it's really challenging to write it out. I have to confess because in this politically correct age that we live in, saying anything that's kind of critical of black people can be quickly construed as either racist or bigoted or whatever. And when I write, I try to write bluntly and honestly. And any culture, any society has shortcomings. And and people have shortcomings. And so I could write about that easily about Eastern Europe and didn't feel any kind of repercussions. But now as I'm typing, I'm like every single time, like, ooh, that sentence, that's somebody's going to take that out of context or they're just going to misunderstand what I'm trying to say. And so it's just a very frustrating book to write in many ways because I I feel like I'm walking on eggshells, especially, you know, I'm from the United States where we have the whole Black Lives Matter movement and the politically correct movement. And I'm not politically correct. <laughs> I'm very blunt. Um, and and yet uh, I'm sensitive to it because I'm from San Francisco, possibly the most politically correct city in America. And it's uh, so I'm very aware of it. And I think it's, it's like this balance because for those who are not from politically correct, they look at me how I'm writing and kind of like I'm kind of waffling or having to re- remind people like, look, I understand this. I'm like, why is he writing in such a soft way? You know, why does he just say it as it is? So it's just a very challenging book to write in many ways. In the end, I'm defaulting to my normal way of talking, which is no bullshit and just tell it like it is. And if you think I'm a fucking racist, well, sorry. And, you know, don't buy my book. So in the end, that's going to be my thing. But I'm trying to af- not offend the entire planet. <laughs> um, so <laughs> it's it's a challenging book to write. Having read your your previous work, I yes, it's certainly blunt, but I think it, you know it's not it's not targeted towards any one group of people so much as everyone. Like, hey, I'm going to go to your country and. 90% of it is these are the cool adventures that I had and what I learned and 10% of it is you know what's really frustrating about 
the Czech Republic. Let's start with the name. Things like yeah, that. and so and that's all fine and good for Eastern Europe. Or I can make fun of the Serbs and and I can you know point out the Albanians and how you know or whatever or the Russians and the Ukrainians and and people will it's especially since I kind of do it equally to all of them, like as you say. But it's just a different beast when it comes with Africa. If all of a sudden I'm either making fun of them, I'm like, well, they're poor and you're just being so heartless, motherfucker. I mean, like, it's like, you know, don't you have some compassion? Well, maybe it's because it's the white man's fault that that's why they're all fucked up or whatever. <laughs> it's just like, it's, it's, it's a much trickier thing. If you, if you just, if I wrote the hidden Europe and just replaced it with African country names, uh, I would just, get so much shit for it and in fact that's probably what i'm going to do i mean it's just i'm sorry but that's you know, i just think it, it it's something that needs to be i have a unique perspective i'm not normal and i just gotta let it hang out <laughs> yeah and i think the fact that you've been to so many countries as you said gives you that that unique perspective and uh and sort of enables you to make those comparisons because I, I, I don't want to put words in your mouth but the way it comes across to me is not I'm better than you, here's why, but rather every place in the world has its idiosyncrasies and it's fun and interesting to tease them out and sort of look at them as we've been doing in this conversation, right? It's just that no one's here to say that like Spain is necessarily better or worse than any other country in Europe, but it is different in this in this particular way and that's fascinating. Right, and, and people are fine with stereotypes of African countries as long as they're positive stereotypes. So if I say, you know, Africans are so joyful, they love to dance, they have great music, they're very funny, they have a great sense of humor, they're patient, they're generous, they're, you know, they're hospitable. You know, nobody's going to fault you for making any of those generalizations. Everybody's going to say like, yes, absolutely. Yeah, 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 that's great. But if I say they're lazy motherfuckers, I'm like all of a sudden, boom, that's going to just like be a completely different thing versus uh, so that's the irony is that we're we're very um uh we're very quick to applaud stereotypes that are positive but if a stereotype is negative then boy you can you then you're automatically a bigoted and so and yet we all know that a there are generalities among cultures there's generalities between men and women. There's generalities between a teenager or what a teenager is like. Uh, there's generalities for every fucking thing under the sun. And that's just reality. And generalities can be positive and they can be negative. And we know that about everything. But somehow in our culture nowadays, we're so easily triggered that people resist any kind of negative generalities of a cultural group, especially if that cultural group is poor or um you know uh, a minority or something like that that's when it's really because if if i make a generality that people in the forbes 400 the richest people in america are you know selfish jerks if i make that negative well it's fine because they're rich white men so we can go ahead and insult them and, as much as we want but if you you know insult a homeless person and saying you know hey that guy is mentally i don't know who knows what uh then all of a sudden that's wrong. So eh, it just it it's 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 a frustrating world that we live in. In that sense, uh, I think there's so many benefits to being culturally sensitive and 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 sensitive to groups that have been persecuted. But at the same time, uh, I think we're often going overboard to the point where we're shouting out debate and discussion. And we're um, quickly resorting to name calling in order to try to humiliate whatever person is trying to make a relatively balanced or objective comment, or at least stir discussion in a kind of non-hostile way. And no matter how delicately you try to put things, uh, there's there's a uh, an army of people on the internet who try to twist that and, and cancel make you, you seem yeah, like I mean, a demon. I think we have freedom of speech and, and, and we sort of talk about it in this kind of um, – like, like we all respect it as this really important right, but we forget that you don't need freedom of speech to say kind of you know things that everyone agrees with. You only need freedom of speech if you're going to say things that are potentially – 
you know, inflammatory or that not everyone's going to agree with her that put you in the minority or put you against the people in power or whatever. And so, you know, another reader, myself, even we may not agree with everything that you say, but I think the fact that you, you know, you should have the right to say that and have your opinion and put that out there. And then, yeah, let us debate it. Let us consider it. Let us say, hey, this Francis guy wrote this thing and he's wrong and here's why, or I agree with him, or he has this take on Malawi and I think he's totally off base. You know, I lived in Malawi for 30 years, and here's what I think about it. But if you can't even make the original point, then we can't have that discussion. If we can only, you know, if we can only say certain things about certain people or certain places, then I think that's that's even more dangerous because those opinions are still there. They're just hidden, and we can't discuss them, which is, you know, not not where we want to be. Again, most importantly, I think you're in your particular case, right? You're you're even-handed with, <laughs> you know, here's what's wrong with your country gets applied to many different countries as you travel the world. What about back home in America? Are there things that, you know, a lot of us who do long-term travel, like this this idea of reverse culture shock gets discussed, right? Where we spend a lot of time away from home. In your case, you spent five and a half years in Africa and then came back to America. Were there certain things that, uh, I'm sure there were comforts and stuff that were nice to get used to again, but were there other elements where you're like, this is crazy, what's wrong with these people? Why do they do it this way? Being back in the U.S.? Yeah, there's probably... Yeah, no, it, it, there are things. I mean, I suppose I saw a lot more things better through the eyes of my wife because uh, she comes from the Sahara Desert and a, you know, a place that, that has no electricity, no running water. Uh, she had to get her... She had to walk you know, a good distance to get you know, water from a well. And she comes to America and she's just surprised by the amount of go, 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 go mentality they have. And you yourself confess that you kind of suffer from that as well. And I certainly do too, because we, you and I grew up in this kind of go, go, go environment. And I don't necessarily say it's a bad thing. It's just a characteristic. Uh, it's just uh, a feature. And there are some benefits to it. Obviously, we're a very productive society. We, you know, come up with all sorts of inventions and, and, uh, and, and we've developed medicines and we've developed uh, agricultural techniques to feed uh, nearly 8 billion people. You know, these are all good things. And there's, uh, there's a, the downside is, you know, it's a double-edged sword. So we have a society that can be sometimes uh, so future-focused or at best it's present focus that you know we just we just don't have time to kind of sometimes slow down and, and smell the roses which goes way back to the beginning of our conversation which is walking hiking in the wilderness without any kind of connection to technology to have to give yourself a break and to kind of slow down that that vigorous vigorous pace that Americans uh, have and so i don't you know it's it's a it's a quirky thing about the us culture but i think it, and we're not the only ones to have it i understand i've never been to china but I've, i imagine the chinese are also pretty uh, go go goes and certainly in japan you'll see that so there are certain societies that have that i think europe in general if we were to generalize has a kind of more of a balance with the northern Europeans being a bit more go go go, which you kind of alluded to before, so I guess that's probably the thing that would stand out the most is just our productive, uh, nonstop culture, which is I mean nonstop work yeah, ethic I, that we have. I certainly agree there. I think just a prioritization of work in general, right? Seeing seeing work as uh, it's so it's so heavily intertwined with our egos. And I don't mean ego in the sense of like, I think I'm better than everyone else, but just our sense of who we are um, growing up in the East Coast, specifically in D.C. The stereotype is that we always ask, what do you do as the first question? Even if someone from like D.C. moves to California, the joke is supposedly that Californians are going to make fun of the person for always asking, like, hey, what do you do as the first thing? Not only am I guilty of that or was I guilty of that growing up, but the idea that that wouldn't be your first question Right. Didn't even like occur to me that, that like you would ask that and obviously not as like a 10 year old, but as like a 25 year old, for example, where everybody's so career and status driven on the East Coast. The idea that like anything other than like your job would be sort of a, a way to define who you are was just almost an anathema to me at that point. Um, we in America, I think, also suffer from um this like American centric view of the world where we see everything that's revolving around us because in many ways, geopolitically that's true. And in some ways, culturally with Hollywood and things like that, but there's just, you know, there's 
billions and billions of people out there around the rest of the world who just they're just they're, they don't love hate or, or hate America. They're just indifferent. They're just living their life in their own place. And we sort of have like project this idea that like everybody in Uganda is sitting around thinking about us all day, one way or the other. Which uh, I don't from from your travels, I'm sure you've experienced is often not the case. Not never, but just often not. Uh, it's just people have their own. You know, I got to go get water today. I'm not worried about you know what this president said or what's going on in this country or whatever. Um, I think we also we um, we tend to think of ourselves as like you know America is the greatest country in the world, and you know that's fine, right? Like, I think everyone can be patriotic wherever they're from. But uh, we sometimes lose sight of the fact that other countries are better at different things, if not better overall, just, you know, we all have strengths and weaknesses. I think America's absolute strengths, though, are are what we talked about in the beginning, comfort. If you want to sit in like an air conditioned SUV with cushy seats and uh, drive to the Costco and have to walk the minimum distance outside between the parking space and the door of the store, walk into the store and be treated as a king, customer service, um, and go back home and just have everything be as comfortable, convenient, and customer focused as possible. Those three, uh, Japan definitely has amazing customer service, but those three, customer service, comfort, and convenience, I think America is like, you know, above the rest of the world, hands down, if those are your priorities. Yeah, no, it's definitely true. It, it definitely stands out on, in the, on those metrics for sure. Uh, it, it, you know, it amazes Rejoice, for example, that, you know, you can buy something and then return it, uh, even though you've used it. <laughs> it's just like in Africa, when you buy something, even if you re- try to return it new in the box, shrink wrapped, they'll still say like, nope, you bought it. You keep it. Yep. That, that is a definite difference with, I think, most of the world, although our American sort of corporate culture is certainly spreading and you see more and more of that sort of Costco style to use the same example around the world. Um, I think we're we're close to wrapping up, but I, I would be remiss if I didn't ask uh, what's next. I mean, we talked about all the crazy adventures that you've had so far, and and I know you're working on the Unseen Africa book. But where do you go from the here? The Middle East and West Asia, so West and Central Asia, should I say, is my next trip. Uh, that's my big uh, project. That I unfortunately right now because of. COVID-19, I'm a bit uh, unable to travel. And also I want to finish my book. So I should have finished my book by now. But anyway, that's another story. But the trip is to go from Pakistan all the way out to Israel and see all the stans in between and the whole Gulf states, see all that. There's roughly 25 countries in that region. And I'm you know, basically diving into the heart of Islam because that's the, the kind of the shared thread throughout all those countries. And after that would be going to East Asia. So to go from India all the way out to, you know, the Philippines and, and Japan and that kind of stuff. So, and that would include Siberia, I suppose, and Mongolia and Southeast Asia. And then the third big trip would be to buy a boat and go to the islands, specifically the, the Oceania. So all the Pacific Ocean islands, including Australia and New Zealand. So those, that's the three big trips that I have planned out for this 2020s. And that should finish up most of the world for me. And maybe I'll see some Caribbean islands that I haven't seen. And just there's a handful of other countries like in South America. I haven't been to like five countries in South America. So then that will kind of complete the tour. And then the world will end for me. No, <laughs> I have no idea what. After that, who knows what I'll, I'll be doing after that. But that's the big trip. Well, given your history, I wouldn't be surprised if you went back and did them all again in the reverse order or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, who knows what I'll be feeling by then. But, uh, you, know, I might, you know, I might surprise people and just become normal finally. <laughs> I might get a real corporate job somewhere and just like settle down. No, I was going to say, I think you'll be retirement age by the time at the pace that you travel, which is a, a quite a leisurely pace. Uh, by the time you hit all of those countries on those various trips, I, I think uh, it'll be at least a couple of decades from now. Yeah, perhaps. yeah, yeah. But maybe I'll maybe I'll have uh, blown through my retirement money and I'll all of a sudden have nothing left. And so therefore I'll have to be a 65 year old who actually has to work. <laughs> But that'll be fine if, if if I have to work at sixty five. I mean, like, 
I, I wasn't sure I would even, oh, I'm still not sure if I'm going to get to 65. And so, you know, I, I, I thought to myself, okay, well, I have no idea how long I'm going to live. And have you, by the way, had any of your classmates died already? Any of the people you grew up with, your age group? Yeah. Um, un, I mean, fortunately and unfortunately, right, I, I haven't lost any of my like closest friends, but there are people who I knew kind of growing up in school and things like that who, uh, who've passed on and, uh. It's uh, that's an eye opener, isn't it? Yeah, that's yeah. what I was about to say. But unfortunately, it's just like yeah, it reminds you how uh, how fragile life is and how none of us. I mean, I'm I turned 37 yesterday, and uh, yeah, that's I mean every every day is uh, is not guaranteed, right? Yeah, I remember this. The the first one that I, I distinctly remember was a kid in high school, and he got leukemia, and he died at like sixteen years old or fifteen years old, something like that. Then I remember in uh, college, my, one of my closest friends in college hung himself, he, suicide. Okay, so maybe that's not appropriate as a as an analogy because there it was purposeful, but he died. And then in business school, when I went to Harvard, there was this guy who uh, got brain cancer, like a like a five or 10 years after he graduated and died from brain cancer at younger than you, dude, like 35 years old or something like that. And he died of brain cancer. Um, and just things like that happen and let alone, you know, the, the random accidents and things like that. It's, it's, that's what I think motivates me to, um, you know, live the richest life that I can live now and, you know, project maybe no more than five years in the future because you may not get five years. You may not even get five years hours <laughs> so but but i think five years is a good metric because it's enough time to like not be too obsessed with every moment of life and allow yourself to have some space but at the same time i think it's a mistake when people just assume that they'll make it to 70 or 80 years old that's also kind of a dangerous thing I'm going to uh, leave your audience with one final uh, thought uh, regarding, because your podcast is called Never Normal, and that could have been the title of my first book, which is called Hike Your Own Hike, Seven Life Lessons from Backpacking Across America. And the idea of hike your own hike is the same thing as never normal. In other words, I think in society, we have a tendency to focus on what the rest of society is doing expectations and things like that. And the idea of hiking your own hike, it's a phrase that we use on the Appalachian Trail, which is listen to what other people think about or what they're doing, that kind of stuff. Get advice, but ultimately listen to your soul, listen to your values, and don't deny them so that you hike the way you want to hike. People will say about, you know, like, oh, you got to wear different shoes. Oh, no, you got to have a different type of backpack or, you know, you got to walk faster. You got to walk slower. You can listen to those advices and you can even incorporate it. But ultimately, stay true to who you are and hike your own hike, and which is quite a similar message as your message, which is never normal <laughs> and, 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 and be true. And, and if it's idiosyncratic, that's fine. But... Uh, I think too many people often get obsessed about what the rest of society thinks and it takes, and, and as a result, they deny aspects of themselves, objectives that they want to do. And it's sad. In my case, for example, I went to Harvard Business School. The expectation was that as an MBA, you're going to go out there and work on Wall Street, make a lot of money and uh, or, or any kind of company, Fortune 500 company, and do a lot of money. And I just thought to myself, I want to hike my own hike. I don't, I, I, yes, I know the expectations that everybody who are in my class have of me and my parents have of me, yeah. but I wanted to stay true to what I really want to do in life. And that's what I did. And if I hope I've inspired some people who are listening to this or watching this to not uh, crush that side of themselves and instead to keep listening to your podcast and maybe get inspired that hey don't be afraid to do what you actually love to do i, I couldn't say it better myself um uh, that's that's exactly why i'm doing this not not because any of these people who i'm interviewing yourself included have lived the perfect life and you should copy them but just to show all the options that are out there and you know as you said hike your own hike be never normal 
uh, and I think the more we the more we travel the world, the more we really discover ourselves and and who we really are, and we shed all of that kind of baggage that we've picked up along the way of other people's expectations and society and culture, and just open ourselves to the world of all the possibilities that are out there, and I think it's experience it all and enjoy. Francis, thank you so much for coming on and and sharing that message and and telling us some of the lessons and stories uh, from your travels. I uh, will link to everything in the show notes, your books. We'll be looking forward to the Africa book. And uh, and uh, I'm, I didn't even know about the Patreon, so that's cool. I'm going to sign up for that so I can read it as it comes out. I don't even have to wait yeah. for the wait for it to be officially published. But as I said, we'll link to all of that. And uh, everybody go check it out. And one last thing. Last also, I've done three TEDx talks. And so you might want to link to that or those who are listening, just search for my name under TEDx under YouTube and you'll see the three TEDx talks. And uh, that might also be useful for some people. Awesome. Uh, again, I'll link to all of that. Francis, thank you so much for joining. Uh, I look forward to continuing to follow your adventures around the world. Thank you so much, Neville. Bye-bye. <laughs>